have internet working. Uh, the Wi-Fi and password are over here. Um, I would like you to go to uh, that URL, tinyurl.com, tinyurl.com forward slash goa dash warm up one. So we're going to do two warm up questions. When you go to tinyurl.com slash goa dash warm up one, you'll get that page that you can see over here. Okay. <clears throat> Is everyone, bothered? anyone still working to get the URL? <clears throat> yeah, okay, I see some people still working. Let's wait. <clears throat> so once again, it's tinyurl.com slash goa dash warm up one. Goa dash warm up one. <clears throat> Because a lot of us are joining, it's working. it's working. Okay, it's working there. It normally, doesn't work there. <laughs> Very good. Okay, <clears throat> so let's walk through this warm-up question. Uh, this is a simple warm-up question. Then we'll do a more complex warm-up question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the style in which we'll give refute questions. This is a suggested style. So first we have a comment explaining what the code is supposed to do, right? This is the intent. The code, this function is given an integer n and it is supposed to calculate the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. That's the intent. Then there is the artifact. This is produced by AI or it is produced by another human being and it is buggy. Now you might say, how is it buggy? Is it the right formula? No? 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is n times n plus 1 by 2. This is what we want our students to also think. Are this looks right. But then we want them to go deeper. Why is this not correct? Fine. Everyone remembers the formula from uh, school. 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is n times n plus 1 by 2. This is doing exactly that. Right? For this intent, this code is looks like it's matching that intent, but it is wrong. Our question, our refute question is below this. It says, show that this function is buggy by giving me two things. So on this web page, there are two parts that are, that are editable. It's in this white color box. You can edit over here. You give me an input, and then you tell me the correct answer for that input. Remember, if a student can't tell me the correct answer, it means maybe they haven't understood the question. For example, suppose my student says, oh, you know, <clears throat> on the input 3, the correct answer is 3. Not true. Because on the input 3, the correct answer should be 1 plus 2 plus 3. It should be 6. But my student has misunderstood. My student thinks that on input 3, the correct answer is 3. So we try it, we click on code check. And it says, for input 3, 3 is not the correct result. That's what's actually happening. It was expecting you to have success. It's, you don't have success, you have a horrible red error message saying, you did not achieve success, you got this message. I was expecting you to get success, but in fact, you're seeing this message, okay? Fine. So we'll try something else. In fact, I want you to suggest, give me an input. The function is supposed to calculate 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. I'm telling you the code is wrong. So give me an n for which this does not produce the correct answer. What is the input? What is the correct answer? And we'll check it. Should we try like a corner case, like zero or something? Zero, yeah. 
Let's try zero. What's the correct answer for zero? What's one plus two plus three all the way up to zero? It's zero. It's an empty summation. Empty summation, sigma over an empty set is zero, right? Product over an empty set is one. Empty product is one, empty summation is zero. So the correct answer should be zero. Okay. By the way, suppose I make a mistake. Yeah, well, uh, we've already seen that. It will tell me if I, if I get the wrong answer. Okay. The correct answer is zero. So I submit that. And again, I get a red message. It says the function is not buggy for the input zero. Why? Because for the input zero, look what the function does. It does zero times zero plus one by two. Zero times anything is zero. It's going to produce zero. That's the correct answer. In our flow chart, it's a valid input. We have got the correct answer, but actual is equal to expected. It's not a bug. It's not found a counterexample. For a negative value, 1 plus 2 plus up to a negative number is still an empty summation. right? So let's say minus 1. Minus 1 is going to work or no? Let's try it. We've got a website in front of us to do it. We don't have to think too much. It's not. Why is it not a bug? Minus 1 plus 1 is 0. <laughs> it's working. Minus 2. Minus 2 times minus 1 divided by 2. That's not correct. For minus 2 also, it's an empty summation. Right? Success. We got the green message. Success. We have found a counterexample. If we were to do this in a lab setting, we could set up a problem like this, and we could ask the student, finally, when you get success, just tell me what input you got. What input did you get? So they'll say minus 2. I tried minus 2, and I, I got. I, I broke the code with input minus 2. Is this OK? Now, because this is C, this code also fails for a positive input. But this you have to really understand a lot of things, bring a lot of things together to understand why it's going to fail for a positive input. What would happen, what would happen if I gave it the input 50,000? I'm claiming to you that on input 50,000, it's going to fail. Why? Integer. Sorry, sir? Integer. Integer range. Very good. Very good. Hey, I like this state. I don't get this answer in many, many, many FDPs that I have done. This is excellent. You guys are doing something very good over here. Whatever it is you're doing, you're doing very well. Is it the, I don't know, it must be the food. <laughs> uh, 50,000. 50,000 times 50,000 plus 1 divided by 2. Let's work out what the correct answer is. Well, I, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but 50,000 is an even number. So 50,000 divided by 2 is 25,000. So the correct answer should be 25,000 times 50,001, right? Right? That should be the correct answer. Yeah, that's a counterexample. Why? Because this number is about 1.25 billion. About 1.25 billion, which is representable in the 32-bit integer range, which is roughly minus 2 billion to roughly plus 2 billion. Right? It's 2 to the power negative 31 roughly to 2 to the power 31 roughly, right? When plus minus 1 on the sum side. OK, so. <clears throat> uh, this is 1.25 billion, it is representable. But this code does 50,000 times 50,001, which is 2.5 billion, which is more than the upper limit, which is 2 billion. So 2.5 billion wraps around to the negative side. And we take a negative number and divide by 2, we get a negative number. Very tricky. Right? Sir. Yes. Ah, but this is code, it's not logic. 
This is code. Code has its own semantics. So in that case, we have to define Correct. And we've just said, given an integer. So for the integer 50,000, for the integer 50,000, which is representable, the correct answer is representable as a 32-bit int. So the client who asks for this question could say, look, for representable numbers, at least I want the answer to be correct. Maybe that is the precise specification. And here is a representable integer for which this code is not producing the right answer. So that is, that is the of yes, yes. And that's why this code is buggy. I mean, this does not satisfy that, that precisely. Okay? I mean, there is a representable integer for which the answer is representable, but this code does not produce that answer. This was just a warm-up question. Right? OK. No surprises for guessing that our second warm-up link is warm -up, Goa warm-up 2. So if you go to Goa warm-up 2, you'll get a more complex question. So tinyurl.com slash goa dash warm up two. Are we there? Can we access this? Seeing this, yeah? OK. What's complex here? Many things. Firstly, the function is actually this one. This is only a helper function for this, OK? So this function is, is given an array A of integers. There's the array of integers of length n. n is at least 1. And it is supposed to return one of these output strings, either up, down, neither, or both. OK? So this function takes an array and an, its length, and it returns a string. OK? It returns either. Up, down, neither, or both. It says up if the array is sorted only in increasing order. Down if it's sorted only in decreasing order. Uh, so to be precise, non-decreasing order, meaning it's OK to have equals, but you should never go down. So basically, non-decreasing. Non Let's call that increasing for simplicity. Okay. So up if it is in that order. Down if it is in this order. Neither if it is neither, or both. Can it be in both? Yeah, if it's equal. If all the numbers are equal, then it is neither decreasing nor increasing. Right? So it is both non-decreasing and non-increasing. Uh, rather tricky problem. Okay? Our student has, I mean, there's some buggy code that's been produced over here. Now here, again, this is the refute question. Show that the sorted function and or the first equal helper function is buggy because we are only going to be able to provide an input to the sorted function. We're going to be providing an array and its length. OK? I mean, essentially the array. Once you know the array, you know its length. So we're going to be providing the array to this function. You provide an array of integers for which sorted returns an incorrect result. Now, does it return an incorrect result because the bug is here? Or does it return an incorrect result because the helper function is wrong? Or both are wrong? We don't know. Somewhere there is a bug. This sorted function, which called a helper function, is not working. The blame could be here, or the blame could be there, or the blame could be both. I don't care. Just show me that this sorted function doesn't work. This is the code you're delivering to the client. The client is saying, no, this is, doesn't work for me. Right? Why it works, doesn't work. You open the box and you see the code. It's not my job. It's not working for me. OK? Fine. <clears throat> so when you solve these problems, please spend a little bit of time reading what it's supposed to do. <coughs> the code could be a little bit complicated. But at least since we are practicing now, we're doing this as educators. We're thinking about potentially asking our students these kinds of questions. Let's get some practice understanding what the code is supposed, or the uh, code is supposed to do. Then we'll 
take a quick look at the code and see if we can see a bug. Okay. Let's just for now, let's just try some uh, inputs and outputs. Okay. So let's say I try the empty input. Is the empty input sorted in increasing order or decreasing order? Both, neither? Increasing order, so we should we say up? Yeah, up is kind of increasing, let's try that. So when we click on code check, it shouts at us saying, look, input has to have at least length one. Remember? It says that in the question, right? So don't give me an empty input because that's not legal. In our flow chart, that was the first thing. Is the input valid or not? The input is not valid, so it's telling us, no, no, don't, don't give us that. Okay, fine. So we don't have to worry about this thing. What about a list containing only one number? Is that sorted? A list containing one number, is that sorted? Sorted? Is it sorted in increasing order, decreasing order, neither, both? Both. Suppose we're silly and we leave it as up. If we leave it as up, it tells us, no, up is not the correct result. Okay. So we say, okay, it's not up, it's both. It says, no, it's not buggy. You're right that the correct answer is up, but that's not a counter example. Okay? Are, the, are these two warm up problems helping us understand how we can tackle it? Remember, our goal is only to, to do some reading, and these are the only two lines that you will be modifying. Depending on the question, the data type for input could be a, a, an array or a number or a string, whatever, it depends on the question. And similarly, the data type for the correct answer could be a string or an int or whatever, right? So you just have to say what the input is and what the correct answer is, and then this will evaluate for you. Is this making sense? So I have deliberately given a very challenging question here. I won't ask you something so complicated, but this is just just to illustrate the range. I mean, remember, these are warm-up questions. I've given you one where the code was very simple, but the bug was tricky. Here, the code is complicated, but if you spend a little bit of time reading the code, you'll figure out the bug, okay? The bug is, I mean, the logic is, what the code tries to do is it tries to say, okay, I don't know if this code, if this array is supposed to be increasing or decreasing. As long as the first few elements are all equal, then I don't know which way it's supposed to go, right? So basically, there's a helper function called first unequal that tries to find a, an index i for which i and i plus 1 are not the same. That's what the first unequal function is trying to do. If it can find an index i for which ai is not equal to ai plus 1, then it's going to return that index i, right? And if it can't find such an index, it'll return minus one to indicate, no, everything is equal. Right? Agreed? So this has some purpose, but we don't know what its purpose is because it wasn't given in the question. This, the designer of the code, has gone and created a helper function which does something. Now I've told you what that something is. Its purpose is to find the first index at which there is a mismatch. AI is not equal to AI plus one. If such an index exists, it returns the first such index. If no such index exists, it returns minus one to indicate that everything is equal. And the caller, when I call this, I capture the answer in this index I, and I say if it is negative, then everything is equal. So the correct answer is both, right? So. Once I have understood this, I can get up to line 18 and I say, okay, it's definitely going to be correct when it says both. Because I believe that this code is correct and I believe this logic is correct. So up to now, no bugs. Yes? This is how we would like our students to reason. 
Now, the bug happens lower down here. What it tries to do is, it tries to see, so I know when I get to line 19, when I get to line 19, I know that this function did not return minus 1. Why? Because if it returned minus 1, this if condition would have been true, and I would have returned from the function. I would have returned both. So the only way I can get to line 19 is I have found an index at which ai is not equal to ai plus 1. Now, is it that AI is lesser or bigger? That I have to check. So, <clears throat> if AI is greater than AI plus 1, I'm going to break. Okay? Meaning, I'm going to stay in this loop as long as this AI is less than or equal to AI plus 1. Okay? So, as long as it's increasing, I'm going to go up. And if I've reached the end of the list, then I'll say it's sort of increasing. Okay? Fine? The bug is right here. Now it's going to try and check the reverse logic and try and do down. But it may have found that unequal point and then made progress going up. It should have reset back to here to check for down. What if the array was going up and then down? Then this logic won't work, right? So if you give a counter example, this takes effort to think about it. But again, this was just a warm up. If I give an input like this, 10, 20, 10, right? So this array is not sorted, right? I go up and then I come down. Right? So then the answer should be neither. And this will be a valid counter example to this piece of code, OK? Our student would really have to understand this code to get it. If they just tried random stuff, like, for example, suppose they said, oh, let's try neither. Let's try a code that goes down and then up. That's also not sorted, right? So suppose there's a 10 minus 20, 10. Hmm? That's, that's not sorted. There the answer is also neither. Well, this code for that input actually produces the correct answer. It's not buggy for this input. It's only buggy when it's a mountain. Okay. If it's a valley, it's fine. Very interesting. OK? So I just wanted to give you a flavor of the types of refute questions. OK? What, what I would like you to solve is, is more similar to the first type than the second type. The second type is just to give you an example of something really complicated that we could have asked. But uh, some of the questions that I will give you will have helper functions. So I wanted you to just be familiar with it. Remember that this intention, this is the intent, it applies to the main function, not to the helper function. And eventually, we won't know where the mistake is. The mistake could be here, the mistake could be here, the mistake could be in both places. We just want an input on which the code doesn't produce the right answer. OK? Yeah? Ready to try some problems out? Yes. Yeah. That means when we when we do that, rotate for code, mm -hmm. that means we tell our students to generate test data. Yes. So indirectly they're doing testing. Yes, yes, exactly. They're saying they're saying that as per this sentence, this intent, on this input, the right answer should be this. The thinking is that somebody or some AI is able to produce code. But we have to check it. And one way to check it is do a formal proof, which is very difficult. But another way of checking, which is very valuable, because it, it's a human being eventually that's going to be able to read this and say, OK, on the basis of this, this is what should happen. The AI can also try and read it, but we don't know it's a black box. We don't know what it has understood. It has produced something. It looks plausible. Is it correct? I don't know. That's what I want my students to be able to critique. I want my students to have a critical eye. And the, the more they can probe the input space and think about what the question is supposed to do, the better chance they have to catch these things. 
maybe the ai is perfectly correct or maybe this code was written by my colleague who is perfectly correct but i have been tasked with checking i have to check his work right students do this in industry today when they go to industry they, this is this is what they do right <clears throat> I say that with confidence because my colleagues who know about industry tell me this. I have never worked a day in industry. So when I make statements like this is what they do in industry, you should always be doubtful because you should cast a critical eye on me because I have never worked in industry. He has, but he, this is what he tells me. <clears throat> okay, so other questions? Other questions can we clarify on, on refute? Yeah? Okay, so let's do this. So we've done our warm-ups. I hope this flowchart made sense now. We've seen several examples of this, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do, okay? I have a request for you, but you are free to, uh, to, uh, to to choose, okay? I'm going to give you this uh, survey to fill, and after you fill the survey, there's uh, the, the hands-on exercises of the type that we have seen. Let me just tell you a little bit about what we want to do. So <clears throat> with some colleagues, I'm doing a research study. We, we are trying to create a database of good refute questions, right? We think it'll be useful for all of us to have. But how do we create refute questions? So the idea behind our research study is, you know, in the past, we used to ask students to write code. Can't we take the mistakes they have made and won't those make good refute questions? Yeah? I mean, it's, a, it's an idea, but I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. So what I would like is, there's a lot of experience in this room from teaching students. I would like your feedback. I'm actually going to give you refute questions where the problems are buggy solutions that actual students have made. I want you to try it out in this code check like website. And I want you to then tell me in, in the, uh, in the uh, form if you think this is a good refute question or no. There's some two or three questions for each one of these problems. Do you think this, I mean, I'm just asking you to use your judgment as a computer science educator. Fine. But <clears throat> all the data that we're gathering is totally anonymous. I won't know that who has said what, right? However, if you don't want us to use it, that's fine. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to assign each of you an anonymous user ID. And we're going to do it in a very simple way. <clears throat> I will be ID 200, okay? I'm going to ask, go around the room, and you are going to tell me either the next number after 200, and that will be your anonymous ID, like 201, or if you don't like 201, you can jump to any other number beyond 200, and then the next person has, will go in decree, increasing order around the room, okay? So if you don't like 201, you can jump as many steps as you like. So I'm 200, and as you say your anonymous user ID, please remember it. Please make a note of it somewhere. This will be your anonymous user ID for the study, right? In the form, in this form, you'll tell me your anonymous user ID, and you'll also tell me if it's okay for me to use your data. If you don't want me to use your data, I will not consider anonymous user ID number, whatever number you tell me. I will just discard that from our analysis. Okay, it's up to you. So I'm 200, sir. 201. Nobody wants to jump. Then I'll know exactly who this group is. <laughs> yeah. 210. Yeah. Ma'am. 14? 13. Okay. Remember your ID, yeah? 16. 20. 25. 30. 31. 35. Oh, she's 35. You have to go increasing. Okay, fine, 34, 34. Uh, let's come back here. 1010. 1010. See, it's, it's, it's under his control, right, 1010. 1020. 1020. No, you have to start. Uh, 
1030. Made it complicated, sir. <laughs> 1050. 1060. 1060. 1060. 2010. 2010. 2015. 2016. 2016. 2016. 2016. 5,000. 5,000 and 5. 5,000 and 10. 7 to 7. 7 to 7. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. 8,000. <clears throat> so I'd like you to go to this URL, goa, tiny URL, goa-refute, okay? <clears throat> so uh, after you submit this uh, brief survey, the last question I think is asking you, uh, do you consent? You can select whichever answer you like. As soon as you click on submit, it will show you the link to the um, uh, questions, the refute questions, right? So. <clears throat> Each Google form that you will see after this one has a link to one of the code check problems, very similar to the warm-up question, the ones that you saw. Okay? So for each one of those questions, we're going to do exactly what we did. Read the question, fill in the input and expected fields, okay? and click on code check, and try and get that same success message. Right? Uh, if you get the success message, you found a counterexample, just copy the input into the Google form. That's it. OK? Input 5 worked, copy input 5 okay, into the Google form. And try this until you get either get the counterexample or you get fed up. I'm going to leave this slide on. And then, even if you don't get the success message, whether you get it or whether you don't, tell me what you think of the question. Because to help us in our research study, this is the value that we would like to get from you. Right? Do you think this is a good research question? See, you know your students better than we can ever know them. So I'm really asking you to think in your context. In your context, is this a good refute question? Right? So <clears throat> that's what we would like to know. And then you can put in your anonymous participant ID. And as I said, if you've said it before that you don't want me to use this ID, I will ignore all these answers. But just have it there, please, if you don't mind. And then you'll see a link to the next question. So that's what we'll do. Okay? Anyone, I'll leave this slide up. This slide is staying on. If anyone gets stuck on any step, please let me know. Uh, you can also do this on a phone if that's the only device you have, but I think it's much better on a laptop. <clears throat> so can someone confirm if you have submitted the first thing? Can you see the link to the next? To the, yeah? OK, excellent. So I have set up all the links correctly. Sorry? According to you, yeah, after you've solved the problem. So there's a link to the code check problem. So try it and then, yeah. So try the code check problem and then answer the question of the Google form. So if someone needs help, just raise your hand. I will try and wiggle way through and try and help you if you need help. Yeah, so it's defined over there. If you just zoom in, there's a definition given over there. Yeah, it's some, so we often do this, like, suppose we want to do something standard like Fibonacci or Armstrong, right? Uh, we know students can Google that. So we can call it a papaya number or, you know, you can call it some number which is not so easy to Google. But the same definition that would apply, right? Yeah. So, so I'll just clarify, if you are able to find the counter example, You'll go to the Google form and type in your input, right? I mean, there's one question that says, were you able to find a counterexample input? The options are no and other. So if you can't find it, you just say no. If you can find it, you click on other and just say, like, whatever, one or five or this array or this string. Whatever your answer is, you just type that there, right? So you just have to type 
<coughs> you found a counter example. So please remember, this is not a test or a quiz. If you need help, please ask. My, my intention is for you to really engage with these questions so that you can make a good decision. Do I want to use these questions? Do I not want to use these questions? Okay. Please ask. We're all friends here. <clears throat> yeah. So, you're saying one to five. One means almost any example would have been a counter example. Five means no, no, you have to really try for a counter example, right? So. Sorry, does it? Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. So it's not going to the second one? Or? Network issue, is it? I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, but eventually you have to want you to try it, right? This is the second question, is it? So I think there's some network issue where many of you are facing. I mean, I can't really help you. This is the second question. Those of you who are trying the second question. Sorry, just a second. Yeah. So I'm just not able to understand this part, sir. Like, okay. So what so is the message you're getting? It says the input for input three, two, three is not, not the, the correct, correct result. Answer. Yeah. As such here, the, when n is two, the yeah. answer should be three. One plus two. No, it's one plus one plus two. Okay. Right. So it'll be four in that case. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah. So. so Success means ah. actually this uh, function is producing some different output. It's different output. Yes. So and I am expecting that it is 20. Yes. And it is not matching. It's not matching. So, so that is success. It's success. So if AI had produced that, human has success. You have shown that the solution is wrong. Right? I mean, see, our goal here is to show that the code is wrong. We're told it's wrong, but we want to prove that it's wrong. So you have success in proving that it's wrong. We need to correct it somewhere. No, 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 not. I mean, that would be the next step. I, I, see, first thing I'm thinking, especially now with these AI technologies, I'm thinking I want my student to know when the code is right or wrong. I want my student to have this doubt. It should, they, my student shouldn't think whatever AI says is right. I want my student to have the ability to critique. Once they have that ability, then two options are available. They can manually fix the code or they can ask the AI to produce another answer. Right? I don't know which one people are going to do, but at least have the doubt. If you don't have the doubt, you just take the answer. No. But sir, we're already heavily dependent on AI. Look at your phone. It's controlling your life. No. <laughs> that, that, Ship has sailed. <laughs> but sir, tomorrow industry will say, we won't hire your student if they don't know how to do it. Sorry? <laughs> Everything you're trying, right? Yeah, all because I was trying to experiment with making it a 180. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which when you assume it should not exist. Right. Uh, Remember, these are sides of the triangle, not yeah. angles. Oh, it's not the angles. Right, it's the sides, mm -hmm. yeah? So, yeah. 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 Sorry. So, sorry, question. What mm. is the difference if it contains duplicate and return? Uh, one. One. Else it should return. Correct. Correct. And then it contains 
Let's see what it's saying. Huh. It says the function is not buggy. So meaning the function is correctly returning zero. So this is not a counter example, but your previous one was, right? Yeah. How will I come to you? So shortest path. <laughs> Sir, I'm going to have to squeeze here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So if the input is given as 45, 45, 90, and yeah. the noise specified is the same value, then you will be get it like. Right. So what you're saying is that on this example, 45, 45, 90, it really is an invalid triangle. Because see, base is 90, 45, 45, so it's a pitch cowed triangle, right? It's not a proper triangle. So it's invalid. But this code is not saying invalid, it's saying something. Maybe it's, a, it's saying a right angle, or I don't know what it's saying, right? So you have correctly identified a counter example. Your counter example is 45, 45, 90. So that's the input you should put on your Google form. Yeah. It, it, the Google form says no or other, you'll click on other, and you'll give the 45, 45, 90. Yeah. yeah. One input integer. Yes. And what should be the correct answer? How many pairs? Yeah. No, 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 no. So this is the helper function. Yes. This is the counter, counter function. function. So the answer should be how many pairs are there? Like there are two pairs or for three example, pairs. If I want to take, try out this example, mm -hmm. three and five, what is the input for this case? So, um, so a prime pair. Uh, for example, three, five is your prime pair. So for example, if you give the input seven, Okay. If you gain put 7, how many prime pairs are there in the range? 1 to, right? 1 to 7. So there's 3, 5 and 5, 7. 2 pairs. So the answer should be 2. Yeah. If I get this means success over here, what does it mean? It means that you have succeeded in breaking the code. The code was wrong. You have found an input on which the code does not give the correct answer. You know the correct answer, but the code is giving a different answer. So you have had success in breaking the code. So then you just go to the Google form. It says, were you able to find a counter example? You have succeeded. So it says no or other. You click on other and you just give your input. Yeah? Yes? So this says that on this input, you are saying the uh, uh, correct answer is uh, this thing. But the function is not buggy, meaning the function is also saying the same answer. It's not buggy, it's correct, right? On that input, it's correct. It may be buggy on some other input. Yeah, only on the invalid one in this case, yeah. 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 Uh, but this is, uh, the next prime is, it, well, is it the next prime number is, yeah, you're right, yeah, 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 yeah. correct. Yes, that means this code is not producing 11, it's producing some other answer. You have correctly figured out that on input 9, the correct answer is 11, but this code is producing a different answer, so you have successfully broken this code. So on the Google form, you just give the input 9 as the counter example. Excuse me, sorry. Just, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Second okay. Second thing is, three. thing is, post lunch, I'm not available oh. because I was only going to be here for three hours, right? Uh, okay. I have something else in post oh. lunch. Okay. So this the faculty can work on it. Oh. Oh. Thing is, I will, I won't be around. So okay. what time are we going to break for lunch? One. Please. One o'clock. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So let's just make the announcement about this. Mm -hmm. right? um, <clears throat> so just a quick announcement. Uh, post lunch. We will be moving to a different venue in the conference room where uh, hopefully everyone's hotspots will also work. So those who can work now, I think some of you are still working, right? Some of you are working, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's great. We can continue working. There was some uh, <clears throat> slight miscommunication, perhaps. 
<coughs> I was only going to be available for the <coughs> first three hours. Uh, so those who aren't here, who haven't been able to finish or who need more time, you uh, have the post lunch session. Unfortunately, I won't be there to be with you. But I have something exciting to share with you before I leave you. Okay, so what we will do is we are breaking for lunch at 1. We'll try and work as best as we can till 12.45. Then I will use this wonderful device to show you something interesting. Okay, I have, I have internet here so I can show you something interesting. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to leave you without an a interesting finale, right? So, so yeah, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> How many questions are there? There are seven. There are seven questions, but please do as many as you can, right? I mean, and by the way, uh, if you get tired of doing it and you need a break, I mean, you can do it in the post lunch or you can do it in the evening, but I would like you to try it. I mean, I, I would genuinely want to know your feedback on these questions, right? It's no point us saying, oh, this is a great way of producing questions if faculty think this is a terrible way of producing questions, right? I, I need your feedback for me to be able to say something interesting, right? it is so confusing to all of us, right? Success means failure and like, you know, I, I was just sharing. So this, this study we just did with some um, PhD students in IIT Kanpur, okay? Because one of my colleagues is uh, from there. We didn't get this feedback. Now I'm going to call my students saying, why did we not get this feedback from that? I mean, if we got the feedback, I would have changed the form, right? But I didn't want to confuse you, right? So this, the, the feedback about this wording of the success message uh, it could have been different. The other thing, the other thing we can do, the other thing we can do, which I think is a very nice feedback has emerged in this conversation, right? I think it came from when we were discussing at your table. When we break the code, it would be nice to say that, look, yeah, the correct answer is this, but the code produces this other answer, so that you can see what it is, right? All this can be done. So let's let's use this as a moment to relax a little. This is this is very. Uh, by the way. Remember I told you, remember I told you he's much better than me, wow. right? So now you know why. I, I make you work very hard, right? So <laughs> NSK shows you some brilliant stuff, and I, I make you do hard work, right? So, okay. So this, uh, this website, this website code check where we've been using, so if you go to the, the, the web uh, codecheck.io. They could write anything, they could not get photocopies. And most of the questions used to be something like this. They had to keep an answer, right? And I would tell them they are here today. Don't study, just relax, go to your movie or concert or whatever. When you come the next day, do not forget to bring your brain. <laughs> and it would be hard for the three hours. Whenever they would come out of the exam, they would say they were really happy about it. But during the exam, they say they enjoyed it. Right? <laughs> so they still wait. My two minutes are over. Okay, thanks. No, it's um, uh, eventually, I think the, what I tell my students is when the semester is over, you'll hate me. When you, when you get your job, then you might think of me. Right? Because the students tell me, uh, in interview, you know, they ask this. And I was glad I knew this. I'm glad, glad I knew it well. That, that's very rewarding to know. And of course, the best, the best part is when they come uh, after they have worked for a few years, then they tell me what industry is really like. And they said, OK, what you taught, taught I thought was really good. Actually, we do much more. But yes, thank you for giving us that basic grounding at least. So, so, so that's good. I'm glad. OK, uh, uh, since we don't have power or when that power comes, let me just tell you a few things about this code check website and, and a few other resources that are very useful. So code check was created by a computer science education researcher for us, us teachers of computer science, right? Uh, so it is completely free. You don't need any account. You don't need any account. Your student doesn't need any account. You can create questions on, uh, uh, on code check <clears throat> of many different types. I, in fact, when the, if the power comes quickly, I, I'll show you some examples of the many different types of questions. It's not just refute questions, OK? So <clears throat> this feedback, for example, about how we have created these refute questions, I can very easily go back and fix the problem, right? And, and improve based on this excellent feedback that I'm getting from you about how to make these better. What I'm showing you, by the way, is the third iteration 
Right? We've been trying to, you know, say, earlier on we used to give a lot of feedback and people were saying this is too much, I don't, I don't want to see this, so I was trying to make it too little. Now I think I've made it too little, so I have to, there's some, you know, middle ground which we have to try and find. Also on uh, <clears throat> the code check website, I will show you how to navigate to it. Um, for different programming languages, there's a large number of regular programming problems. For this problem, write this code, right? Uh, earlier on we were talking outside uh, to faculty, like if you want to make a quick problem set or on an exam you want a question, you can go and refer to this, right? This, this is a nice s s uh, set of problems, right? There are no solutions to those problems, but you can take the question, put it into Copilot, and it'll solve it for you, okay? The, the paper the discussion that's going to happen this evening, uh, this is what we were, um, uh, we did. And we did this study in um, July of 2022. So one month after Copilot got released for free for students, we were concerned now, now students will be using it, so we started doing the study then. <clears throat> what we did is we went to this code check website. There are 160 odd problems over there. For each one, we took the question, copied it, Whatever Copilot co produced, we copied it back into code check. Code check in, check your solution. Just like you've been clicking on that code check button, it's able to check the solution. We just said, did it pass or fail? Now, what if it failed? It, so there's some test cases on those 160 problems. There's some test cases. If it fails one of those test cases, we started thinking, what would a student do? Suppose we gave a regular programming problem and we told the student, look, your code is not right. It fails some test case. So what will the student do? First idea was maybe the student will fix the code. But the second idea is the student won't touch the code. The student will fix the English. Say the question asks for this. The code is not doing that. Let me explain the question differently. Do you understand? Right? It is modifying the question. It's saying, for, I'll give you an example. <coughs> Let's say we wanted to do one of those questions that we did, triangle type or tetrahedron or whatever it is, right? It's producing the wrong answer. So we'll say, okay, here is how you tell the triangle type. First, check for triangle inequality. If it's not satisfying, say um, invalid. Otherwise, uh, check for right angle based on Pythagoras theorem. If it's not, do this, otherwise do that. You know, something, we, we explain in words, just in words, what would you do? And then it can, it's able to solve the code. So what we found is back in July of 2022, when we took the question as is, about slightly less than 50% of the problems it was able to solve. So that means more than half it was not able to solve. But when we went to those other problems that it was not able to solve, and we applied this extra process of explaining the step by step, not by much, maybe two lines more, three lines more, explain the step by step, it was able to go from 50% to 80%, the performance. So now it's only 20% of the problems it was not able to solve. And that was then. Now, straight after uh, Goa, I'm going to Chennai. I'm working with some undergraduate students on a, on a new version of this paper. We've taken the same problems. But now it's not July 2022. It is April 2023. In the meantime, Copilot has got better. What we're saying is, as teachers, we don't want to give such problems that Copilot can solve 80% of the time. So what should we do? One simple idea is, don't give so much detail in the English. Don't explain in so much detail what the question is. Gives very little detail. Maybe the most little detail you can give is just give the name of the function. You know what we're finding? Same problems. 87% of them, it's able to solve with just the name of the English, just the English name. Forget what the question is supposed to do, just the name of the function. 87% of the time, it's able to solve it just with that, and at most one example. So like reverse diagonal, maybe it doesn't figure out directly what to do. Maybe it gives that wrong solution. But you get one example that on this matrix I wanted to do this, it has the code, 87% of the time. So as an instructor, worried about what I should, what, how I should create programming problems for my students, I still don't know the answer, <laughs> right? Now I'm in more of a problem than I was in July 2022, right? So that's, sometimes research papers are depressing to read. 
because it's bad news, right? Is this going to come on, or do we have to do some magic to make it come on? OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to the website codecheck.io, which is, you know, when you're working on it, you can see codecheck.io slash something, something. So I'm going to codecheck.io, and then it will redirect me to this person's site. Horstman is his name, OK? So over here, if you want to create problems of your own, you can click on Upload a Problem. It's non-trivial to figure out how to do it. It takes a little bit of practice. So there's a user guide to explain how, as an instructor, you can do this. No sign-up account for you or for your students. OK? I go here. I scroll down. And I pick my languages. Now, it's not many languages. There's only Java, Python, and C++. Uh, I'm going to show you Python, because that's what I was doing in that research paper that I just explained to you. These are some assignments which I really don't like, but down here, this is where 166 problems start. Starting with branches with no functions, so just simple code is main, the main program. Uh, like I'll give you an example. Give an input given an input string, print the string with the first and last letter removed. Right? So you click on this link, and you get that problem. Right? It has a more detailed version of the question. Given an input string, when the first and last letters are equal, print the string with the first and last letters removed. Otherwise, print the original string. Takes a little while to figure out. So for example, input string is test. First and last letter is the same. We want to print just ES. But if the first and last letter are different, we want to print the string as it is. Suppose I am foolish, and I say, OK, I just print the input string. Input string, right? Now I click on our familiar code check button, and there are some test cases. And you can see it fails on the case test. The expect actual answer is test, but the expected answer is ES. My code is producing test because I just print this. right? And But for ES, I'm passing, right? and a whole bunch of other things I'm passing. I'm getting 3 out of 4 just by writing one line. But I'm not getting 4 out of 4. Distinction. Yes, I'm getting distinction, <laughs> but not. No, okay, so I would write some. Obviously, I would. I would. Write, this is now Python syntax, right? If um, input string zero is the same as input string, do you know this? Minus one, negative indexing. One of the nice things about Python. Very confusing though if you are going backwards in a list. <clears throat> OK, uh, if it's equal, then what do we want to do? We want to just print the middle bit, right? Input string from 1 up to, but not including the last one. If you know, don't know Python, this is very confusing. Um, did I get it correct? Let's see. Hold your breath. Yay! Oh, no, I failed on E. I didn't think of a list of one length, length one. In a link, list of length one, the actual answer is nothing. But the expected answer was E. Why is the expected answer E in a list of length 1? Isn't the first letter the same as the last letter? Is the question buggy? Read the question. When the first and last letter are equal, in a list of length E, just string E, the first letter is equal to the last letter. Print the string with the first and last letter removed. I removed it. I printed nothing. I removed the letter. I go to Horstman and I say, your code is broken. You go to the website, and you go down this long list. There's a bug report form. You give a bug report. At some point, they fix the code. It's somebody's, somebody has made this available to us. It's their time. I don't know when they will rep respond, but the bug report form is there. It's very nice of them to make this re resource available. Okay, So you can <clears throat> try it. There's all kinds of problems here, right? Complex loops, 2D, lists, strings, uh, 160 problems here. And you can add more. As I said, you can create your own and give to your students. Okay, okay. I want to show you a demo of, um, <clears throat> this is my Visual Studio code. I've got down here, I've got Code Whisperer from Amazon, which I've switched off. I've got this little thingy that's GitHub Copilot. It's switched off, and that's Codium, which I'll show you later. OK, I'm going to switch on Copilot. So yeah, enable globally. OK, 
let's think of a complicated C function or program. Someone suggests to me a non-trivial C function that a first year student would really struggle to do. I mean, a good student may be just about able to do. Can you give me as an example? Some challenging problem. C. Sorry? Yes? Come. You, you've seen so many problems. I'm sorry? Sorry, take the? Oh, remove the vowels from a string. Excellent. OK. So <clears throat> it's going to take an input string, and it's going to return a string, right? So car star, uh, remove vowels, vowels from a given um, car star s, right? Something like that, yeah? Code critique. Is it correct? Uh, Uppercase vowels, Upper vowels may not be identified. OK. Very good. So I mean, it's only looking at little a, little e, etc. right? <clears throat> so we don't accept its solution. Make it case insensitive. I didn't even say insensitive. It's, it's able to not only autocomplete code, but autocomplete comments. <laughs> Is this making it case insensitive? It's only doing that portion. So we accept it, and we come down here. It's broken the code into sections. Isn't this cool? Isn't this scary? I mean, is this programming? You know, when compilers first came out, I'm sure someone was saying, no, 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 this is, you can't write high-level code. You have to write assembly code. This is not programming. And now this has come out and saying, you can't write English, you have to write code. This is not programming. Industry will say, look, it works. I'll pay this guy. I'll pay him half, because he used Copilot. But he's able to use it well. I want code that works. This guy is producing code that works. Great. But what if it's wrong? That's why we're doing all this work. We want our students to develop. I, I can try and give examples that are incorrect that this is produced, but those are rare. And those are getting rarer. So rather than wasting my time trying to find such things, I deliberately create buggy solutions. I, every time a student creates an interesting buggy solution, I try and remember it. What a clever, what a clever mistake. I'm sure a lot of people would make this mistake. Let's see if other students can catch it. Right? Let me show you something else. Let me switch off Copilot. <clears throat> I don't like using these tools multiple ones at a time. I'm going, to do, I'm going to show some Python code, because the next tool is better for Python, best for Python. So this is called Codium. And this is completely free for anybody. No IDs required. I think you only need a Google account or some account you need from there. And you get it for free. <clears throat> okay. Now this one is really nice. So I'm going to do some Python code. Anyone want to suggest some Python function, non-trivial Python code that we want to write? Should we, uh, we can do the same thing, but let's do something different. Python, you know, is good with dealing with strings. We could try something else. Any suggestions? Yes? Yes, ma'am. You got some ideas. Go ahead. OK, check if it's a palindrome. That's too easy for it. Too easy for it. Um, 
OK, imagine, let, this is a, it's a very nice starting point of an idea. So we know that palindrome is a very standard question, right? So suppose we want to check if a string is a near palindrome, like almost palindrome, meaning you, if you reverse it, you almost get the same string, maybe one letter off or something like that, right? Suppose we want to do that, right? So <clears throat> we start writing def is near palindrome uh, S, okay? Now here is just doing a regular palindrome, okay? So here we'll put a comment in the preferred Python style. So we'll say it returns true if S is a palindrome or if S and reverse of S differ, it's guessed. It's guessed because I said near palindrome, right? Yeah, how about that? Yeah. Wrong code, okay? It's wrong code, right? It's just doing regular palindrome, okay? Oh, wait, no, that's not correct. That's, that's in fact, useless, right? So why is this, uh, uh, oh, because I've got some duplicate things here. Right? Let me just have it generate again. Uh, what is it going to suggest? Okay, let's say, let's say we do this, okay. Now, this is not right. So I can go to, where is my Codium thingy? Where is it? Eh, this should be, ah, this is Codium. Okay. This is now connected to chat GPT. Okay. So I say, this code, this code does not work. Fix it. So now chat GPT is available to me. In need to, uh, to fix it, could you please provide me with more context for the code itself? Okay, <clears throat> so let's write. Uh, I want the is near palindrome function to work for non-palindromes as explained in the code, in the comment. I don't see any message or comment. What do you mean is there only? Uh, okay, maybe you can click over here. Okay, uh, fix this code. Fix this code. Haha. -ha. So now chat, chat GPT is suggesting something else. Mismatch count. This new function checks something. At most one can. So at the very least, we should be aware of these tools. Our students are going to be aware of these tools. They, they don't need us, right? right? But we should know about it. Right? June 2022, this uh, co-pilot came out. Uh, I asked my uh, students in, um, I think the, the next month, July, I was working on this paper, I asked them, I said, hey, uh, have you started using Copilot? Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm like, what about all the stuff I told you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know so that, that's what it is. There's, there's much more uh, that, can, that can be done here. Uh, I'll show one more demo, which is something I have not explored, um, <clears throat> which I think also makes for a very cool thing, okay? Um, uh, let me switch this off, okay. Okay, um, so let's say I want to write, um, let's say I'm not, I know what I want, but I can't say it in English, right? I can say it in Hindi, I don't know too many other languages, so I'll just say it in Hindi. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, what should we do? Um, some problem, but uh, uh, we can say it in Hindi. Some, some problem. Um, yes, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> Some suggestion, please. Uh, okay, write it in words. Okay, so uh, okay, um, okay, ank shabd me n. Okay. Now I don't know what. Did I say it correctly? Shabd, Shabd me, oh, Shabd. Thank you. Your Hindi is better than mine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, good. Yeah, function. I'll say English, right? Yeah, function. It's auto completing Hindi. <laughs> okay. I haven't explored. I, uh, let's see what it's saying. Correct? Better than me, at least. No, this is not right. <laughs> this is not right. Right? But here's what you could do. Here's what you could do in, in Copilot. And this is, a, this is, I think, super useful, right? I mean, hey, come on. You can say, not hello world, come on. It's figuring out the pattern. Now I'm having it think about the code with those examples. OK? And now it's getting the, what I'm saying. Now, I'm not doing it in a very stupid way, but. <laughs> but I mean, I want you to, this is April 2023. Try back next month. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that was the client's request. I don't know. I gave the example as the client wanted. Huh? Yeah, yeah. This is flaws in this. I'm not saying this is perfect. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and and you know, you wouldn't want it to write it like this anyway. Long if else ladder, right? There's problems with this, but look what it's capable of doing. It's capable of doing this because this is being sent to this model sitting somewhere in California. It's figuring out what I'm saying and mapping that to code and producing it here. And I can give it hints in all kinds of ways. I can try and be clear in whichever language I can be most clear in. Now, large language models need large amounts of data. Most Indian languages do not have large, large amounts of data. Which means those of our students who don't speak a major language are at a disadvantage. On the other hand, they don't have to be particularly good at English or anything else. Because as a fallback, they can just be clear about their intention. If they can say what the code is supposed to do in examples, the paper that I'm just writing, 87% of the time with one example, at most one example, it's able to figure it out. So even if it can't figure out what I'm trying to say, with one more example, it's able to figure out, oh, this is what they mean, write the code like that. How, so you're asking, like, how is it learning in the back end? That I don't, yeah, that, that I don't know. That I don't know. Uh, I understand that um, the base model of these GPTs, they don't update like this on, live. On the other hand, Microsoft is trying to do something. Uh, Microsoft is like the bada bap of OpenAI. They fund, fund OpenAI, and they're doing some their own version of this. And there, there they're trying to do some live updates. I don't know enough about that. You know. Oh yes, no problem at all. No problem at all. That that is that other the, the first paper that I mentioned. Like just go to code code check, and let's just randomly pick one. Okay. 
Uh, let's pick something that looks interesting. Um, OK, how about this? Given a list of integers and a value, return the position of the element that is closest to the value. If there is more than one, return the position of the first one. Non-trivial question. So this is what we did in that code check paper. We copy this in here. And so this is what we do. And now we wait for Copilot to produce an answer. Okay, it's thinking. It's found an answer. Okay, so we take this. We copy this into code check. And we say, look, code check, is this correct? And it fails. So now we go back to this. This is what we did in that paper. We said, OK, it doesn't work. Can we explain this in more detail? OK? What I did with my students now is we don't explain in more detail. In fact, we don't do this at all. This code doesn't work. OK? So we just tell this, this example. On this example, the expected answer is 2, correct? So we just say, generate code for me. Whatever this does, find closest value index. You can't tell from that what it's supposed to do. But find on this input, the answer should be, it thinks the answer is 1. I say, no, the answer is 2. Now generate the code for me. Now it does something else. So what I tell my students to do is, I said, OK, accept this answer, copy it. I'm not asking you to think about what this does. I'm telling my undergraduate students, don't, don't think about it. Just copy it and hit code check and see if it works. It doesn't. Do another example. It, did, it didn't do it in this one, so do another example. Do another example until it either works or doesn't work. My students are telling me well, they've done, done the analysis. For 87% of those problems, it's able to do it in 0 or 1 examples. What they're also telling me is they're saying, we are seeing the code that this copilot is producing, and we wouldn't have written code like that. So we are trying to figure out what does this mean? And one of my students tells me, I've learned much more doing this exercise than I did in the last semester with, with my class. So it's also a way of learning for our students and for us. I've learned a lot about Python this way, just watching the code that it produces. I, I, I wouldn't have thought, like, there was a time when I asked, like, what is Lambda? I don't know. NSK used to talk about this. It used to go way over my head. Now I can attend his classes. I, say, oh, I kind of know what he's talking about. Oh, these anonymous functions. Yeah, I've seen them. I can kind of know what they do. Yeah. So a lot to say here. OK, I have four minutes left. I'll close my PPT stuff. I had one more slide, I think, to, to sh share over there. But um, I really think you should explore this. OK? If you take nothing else from today's session, refute whatever, karna, nahi karna, whatever, at least explore this. OK? I think it's important to, to be aware of what the, these, these things are capable of doing. <clears throat> OK. So if you get a chance to, to do more, please, please do. It will really help our study. OK. So if you want to do this on a written exam, OK, uh, there you don't have this check code check button. How many of you were just trying input, clicking code check, trying input, clicking code check without really reading the code? I used to do it all the time, right? For some, yeah, come on, you can try it, right? In a lab setting, you can let, let it try. But even in an exam setting, you can't do that. I mean, it's very expensive to do because you'll have to trace the code manually, right? <clears throat> so this is an example of a question that we asked. I mean, this is the Python version of an example that we asked earlier at IASC. Now we teach the intro to programming course in Python. We used to teach it in C. So this was the question, right? Um, so there was a question about, the, again, as usual, the question, the code is buggy. It's supposed to take a list of integers and some index. And what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to do is return the length of the longest 
run of equal value static and in index i. So meaning, if I give you a list and I tell you start from here, how many elements are equal starting from here, right? So maybe it's five, 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 five. So the length is three. The length of the run is three. Right? After that, five, 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 maybe either the list ends or there's a six or something else is happening over there. So the length of the longest run starting at index i is maybe three. So that's what it should do. Okay? And you can kind of see, yeah, there's a while loop and it's doing some result plus equal to one returning. Result. Seems like it's correct. Okay? <clears throat> so we asked this question on the exam and the, question, the concern we had before giving the question is, well, what if the student can't find a counterexample? Everything they try works. We had examples like that. All of us is not breaking. Everything we're trying, it's working. right? Student might also feel that it's an exam, it's five marks. What if, are, they, are we going to give them zero? Right? So we said, no, we'll give partial marks for various parts of the answer. So firstly, did you give a correct input? Yeah, input is a list of integers. Please make sure you give a list of integers. Did you correctly calculate the return value? So here we'll give marks for tracing. Right? What we tell the students is, look, we want you to find a counterexample. If you can't magically think of a counterexample, just guess and check. And we'll give you partial marks for correctly checking your guesses. So that's tracing, code tracing. <clears throat> and then if you can understand what the question is trying to do, tell me what the correct answer is for that. Same thing that you were doing in your, uh, this thing, your um, uh, refute questions, right? So give marks for all these things. And we told the students that if it's a five mark question, we'll give you maybe three or four, I forget now, out of those five marks, even if you can't come up with a counterexample. So students are incentivized to try to show what they know. And if they can't get it, no problem. It's not like they get zero. Right? So what I'm saying is these kinds of questions, you can also try on an exam, on a written exam, even though students can't trace it uh, by just clicking a button. Right? They'd have to manually trace it. It's still worth considering. Okay? There's another concern here is, you know, there's so many exam papers to grade, you know, I've got a large class, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Right? So <clears throat> this question, for example, we actually, we could have asked it in general, but we actually constrained it. We said, look, find a special type of counterexample. <clears throat> said, I'm promising you that there is a counterexample where i is 0 and the length of the list is 3. Meaning you don't have to start thinking of list of length 10 and i equal to 7 in that list. Think simple examples. I promise you there's a counterexample. In fact, 3 is the minimum size counterexample for which this will work. So we did some thinking ahead of time that this would work. And then we started getting answers like this. It, it could all be printed nicely in, a, in, in the question paper itself. I mean, or whatever, how if they're a separate answer book, it'll be uh, <clears throat> easy to find. Uh, you know, so these are different answers. Right? You can see people have scratched, tried different things. If you look at this question, only one of them is correct. Uh, in the first answer, the correct answer is actually, what they've said is the correct answer is not the correct answer. So this is a case of the student not getting the problem correct. They haven't understood what the correct answer is. And in the uh, middle case, they have incorrectly traced this thing. So <clears throat> when we were grading this, we could actually just take these values and put it into a little Excel sheet, and it was immediately grading it for us. Right? We were saying, you know, okay, they're going to give one, two, three, four, five numbers. So in general, we're expecting the pattern x, y, x, y, x, p, q, right? And the correct answer is x, y, x, one, two. Any pattern like that gets full marks. If they get a pattern like x, x, y, p, q, Basically, we'll give one mark if p is equal to 2, and we'll give one mark if q is equal to 2. If that's not the case, then we, you know, we, you know, they, they'll either get 0, 1 here, 0, or 1 here, and like that. There's some rows of this thing, right? So one of us spent 10 minutes creating this Excel sheet, and after that, grading this became trivial. Right? It's auto grading, essentially, almost auto grading. You just have to copy from the answer book into the Excel sheet, and you'll get a score. And later on, you can tell the students, this is why we gave the score we gave. Right? So it, these are autogradable. So that's it. I'll close here <clears throat> with some points to summarize. Uh, you know, as I said, I think their ability to critique is something 
is going to become much more important as we look at these large language models. We've looked at these in some contexts. I think we can generalize these to other courses as well. I hope you will find it useful for other courses beyond this. And as I was promised, I will share these slides with all of you yeah, so that you have all the resources. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I can take the same question, change the action verbs, and according to that logic, the Bloom's taxonomy level changes, whereas actually the question doesn't change. So it's a, it's a bit of a game, right? So rather than that, rather than basing, basing it on action verbs, uh, we have proposed some, a more practical way of applying these Bloom's taxonomy levels, because again, we feel there is value in doing this in the right spirit, right? Doing outcome-based education, but in the right spirit. I know they make us do a lot of form filling and table filling and mapping and this and that, cause outcomes, program outcomes, this, that, and they want to see a big document and then they say, haha, this must be good quality education. Of course, that's not true, right? I mean, big documentation does not imply uh, good quality uh, anything. So, uh, so here are some suggestions, right? So uh, I think that, I don't know if the UGC guidelines say the same thing. The AICT guidelines say for written exams, try not to go beyond level four. You know, level five and six, not useful to evaluate on a written exam. So we've only gone to level four. And what we've said is, again, this is in the context of introductory programming, level one questions are the kinds whose answer can be found by lookup. I mean, when you're saying you want somebody to remember it, we're basically saying you want to look up. And in that case, we're saying basically try and avoid this. Level two and level three, in the context of programming, there is some research literature on how applicable Bloom's taxonomy is to programming. Please remember, Bloom's taxonomy originally framed in 1956. Programming was not really a thing in 1956. It was for a very niche set of people. Uh, of course, it's been revised since then, but it is there's research that talks about this is not really fitting what we want. So the best I've been able to understand that research is saying that when it comes to the distinction between level two and level three, understanding and applying, it's really a matter of degree. In both cases, in some sense, you are applying first principles to solve a problem. But it could be that in one case, these first principles are fairly easy for the student to apply. In some cases, they're rather complicated for the student to apply. I'll give some examples of this. So the, here is, in both sense, in some sense, that you know, even this is a, a form of uh, applying, really. And it's just that these are, in some sense, easier than here. But what's distinction about analyzing is it's not a technique. That is to say, students, when they're solving a, let's say, a refute question, or an explain in plain English question, like we saw. If I give you a piece of code and I say, explain what its purpose is, there's no technique that you can go tuck, tuck, tuck and solve it, right? You have to think about it. It's not a standard technique or tarika that you can just apply. Right? You have to think about what it's supposed to do. Could it be doing this? You have to try some ideas. So then they must consider either multiple known approaches or in some sense create an approach for that problem. And so we're distinguishing level two, level three, where it's a known technique versus level four, where the technique is not known. And that's an important distinction. And then they ask us to write all these course outcomes. And they say, well, what is the recommendation for you? Five outcomes, is it? Four outcomes, five, six outcomes, four to six. So since they say four to six, then we do four because there's less paperwork if we do four, right? Uh, you know, we have to map all these. And again, taking it in the right spirit, internally, I think it's useful to have more outcomes so that everybody is clear, okay, this is what we mean by this is different. If we club everything into four, it becomes very coarse. And the same outcome can be interpreted by one teacher this way and one teacher that way and then you're not really speaking the same language. So at least internally, have many. I've seen a model curricula for intro, intro to programming where there's about 14 course outcomes, which I think is a little bit crazy, right? Uh, so here I'm proposing seven, and you can take a look at this. And there's a, some ordering to it. So course outcome one is students will be able to, so all the course outcomes begin with, at the end of this course, students will be able to do something. Trace the execution of short programs. And how, how short? Well, roughly <coughs> 10 lines. It doesn't have to be so strict. You can give a 12-line pro program. 
but the idea is to give a give a sense. Look, we're not talking about hundred line programs here. We're not asking them to trace hundred line programs. We are tracing short programs. Okay. And by the way, those programs involve familiar things. Familiar. Con he's not suddenly going to introduce new stuff that they haven't seen. <clears throat> that is uh, familiar constructs, right? And if you are giving some unfamiliar constructs, if suppose you are asking students to trace something and you are calling some uh, library function which they haven't seen, that's still useful to ask them to trace. What you can do is you can give them the documentation of that library function. Because then you are testing their ability to read that documentation and say, ah, I understand what this is saying. After all, as professionals, they'll have to read documentation also. So this is also checking them on that. So can you trace either given the uh, just familiar code or even if you are using some unfamiliar code, give the documentation. Okay. This is that explain in plain English. And notice it's at level four. Typically, when you write your course outcomes, you don't tag them with the Bloom's taxonomy level. Here, we're doing that just to indicate that this is a skill that will require at least some practice with, you know, not just procedural stuff, right? So explain what a short program does. Again, at most 10 lines. CO3 is, recognize it? Refute. Demonstrate that it's buggy. Let's refute, right? And then there's more. Fix the bug. The stuff that's underlined is more appropriate for a lab, not for a written exam, right? Because there, you want students to use modern IDE and various other debuggers and things like that. You can't do that in an exam. Sometimes you can. You can give a screenshot saying, OK, when I, when I ran this in a debugger, I got this message. There's a screenshot of that. Now what should we do? Right? Is it this or this or this? Right? So this kind of question we could ask. But show that the code is buggy and fix the code. CO4 is writing code. Right? So we tell the students for a given task, uh, write code you know, and write it properly. Consistent documentation, programming standards, uh, styles. Right? So notice that some things are level 2, level 3, and some things are level 4. The things for which it's not like there's a technique for writing code, but we're saying write simple code. Students have got enough practice with it that they can just write the code fairly mechanically. Okay? That, that's the intention, to get them to the level where this is a mechanical, fairly mechanical exercise for an exam, written exam. <clears throat> CO5 is rewrite code. So I give you code. It does the right thing. You know, it's not a refute question. This was the task. This is a correct solution. But in some sense, it's not written properly. There are better ways of doing the same thing. Those of you who are familiar with Python, for example, I'll give a Python example. You're familiar with list comprehension or those kinds? I mean, those, those very cute ways of writing. Some, some I want to take an input list, and I want to produce this output list. It's a nice, simple return, one line, this thing. That's a nice way of writing it. You could also write it with a loop where you begin with the list is empty, and if some condition happens, you append to the list, append to the list, append to the list, and then you get the final list, and you return that. That's also possible. But the first one is more Pythonic. It's more readable. Once you learn how to read it, it's more acceptable if you can write it that way. So can you rewrite? And then these last are more appropriate for a lab again. Uh, you know, use appropriate tools for building source code, for testing and deployment, and then conducting personal code reviews. I'll give you some examples from this model uh, solution that illustrate this. So I think these examples are all in Python, uh, but you know, you can think. So <clears throat> this one is attached to course outcome four. Remember, course outcome four is write a short program, right? So write a short program, you know, the, the, this problem, and there's a footnote here. You go to footnote one, and it says, you don't put footnotes in an exam, but just for your reference, it's from a code check problem. Right? It's, it's taken a code check problem and, and, and slightly modified it uh, here. Right? So given two integers, print their sum. If somehow the sum is more than 100 or less than 0, print sum is out of range instead. Right? So can the student understand this and produce the code? Question two, this is a recursive function. 
rewrite only lines four to nine to improve the readability of the code. The code is correct. It does something. But lines four to nine are not written well. Can you improve the readability by making it better without changing the function's behavior? Okay? okay. So that would be an example of course outcome five. Again, I mean, if, if you're familiar with Python, you can think of ideas here, but maybe. Then, course outcome two, explain. Explain in plain English. Explain what the function does in general. <clears throat> and then rewrite the entire function using iteration instead of recursion. Right? And be sure to choose sensible names for the function. That's where we get into, you know, are you writing code properly using proper... Add a doc string with at least two doc tests so that it's immediately clear what the function does, right? And that's 10 marks because there are many things that are going on in that. One challenge is I can put out a model exam like this and I can say this question is two marks, that question is 10 marks, that question is three marks. And I know you have to, be, many times you have to design an exam within a very restricted template. You can't ask a question like this, right? Am I correct? You'd, you'd have certain restrictions, right? So you'd have to take this and break it into smaller questions, right? I'm just saying, in an ideal world, this is it. And I'm just showing you how you could address specific course outcomes at the appropriate Bloom's taxonomy level as a question. Okay, um, okay I mean, it, it just goes on. There's a, there's a handful of questions here. Here, So this one is about tracing the execution. Um, there was also a sample solution for this one. And uh, this is fixing the bug. Yeah, so this is, this is an example. So, you know, the, the question does something. Now the specification has changed. The client says, no, I don't want that code. I want something else. So there's, they've changed the specification. Now it should do something else. Okay, that was it. That was the, that was the end exam. I think, I think the most valuable take, uh, we were having this conversation at lunch, right? that, you know, are we, is outcome-based education valuable? I know they make us go through a lot of paperwork, which makes us think that this is complete waste of our time, everybody else's time. The spirit of outcome-based education is probably useful. And my only advice would be, internally maintain a detailed list for what the COs are. For external, for, for the NBA and NAC, et cetera, we tell, no, no, it's only these, right? And this is where we'll do the mapping. But internally, I come and join your institution. I want to know how is this course taught? If you have detailed low level outcomes for me, it's much easier for me to get a sense of what you mean. And then I see this exam question say, how does this map to the course outcome? In the printed version of the exam, we will never give all this kind of tagging. But there's an internal version of it, internal version that you'll give me saying, look, this is CO4. This is what we mean by CO4. Because I'll say, what do you mean by co writing code? What's an example? Well, here's an example, right? This would be very helpful for the next uh, faculty to join. And, you know, internally, for you to have your internal conversation. You don't have to let this come out of your department, right? But it's helpful to have it. Uh, in-house. And then, and essentially there's a subset of this information that you filter out to the, this thing. Right? I, I'm, I'm just, see, I'm not a, uh, I, I don't, yesterday Professor Venkatesh Kamath was here. He is an expert on what goes on inside NAC, for example, right? So I ran this by him. He said, this was, this would be wise. <laughs> this is what I would do, right? If I was on the other side of it, this is what I would do, so. Okay, this was, as I said, out of syllabus. <laughs> Again, maybe there's some ideas here you can take uh, in, in, in your work. Did you have a question? Okay. Okay, I think you're now supposed to continue working on stuff, right? Or uh, how many are done with the seven questions? Oh, I'm is done. Five. So almost done. Good. <laughs>